Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure for uh, Eric, for Yuval, and for me to be here with you, among so many friends and distinguished guests. And we would like to tell you a story, the V story. As those of you who are dentists here well know, the modern era of implant dentistry has started some five decades ago. And the first implants that we were introduced to were parallel sided with external hacks. They were machined, not like in this picture, later on surfaces were added. And at that point, we would accept a resorption of the bone of about one to two millimeters, recession of the soft tissues around those implants is something acceptable. In the gold standards, this was something that we used to refer to. And the main issue those times was the osseointegration, integration, whether those implants will integrate with the bone or not. Some called it osseointegration, integration, some called it functional ankylosis, because as you know, it started at the same time by Schroeder in Switzerland and P.I. Brennemark in Sweden. Then the Swiss came with the tissue level implant, which was functioning great, but had some limitations in terms of prosthetics and aesthetics. And then during the 90s, we were introduced to conical shaped implants and to different type of internal connections. At the same time, we also started to use this type of uh, uh, very narrow uh, one-piece implants that we saw that although they were very fragile, we were able to create much better surrounding around them in terms of bone and soft tissue. So at this period, we started to see that there are some problems <coughs> with the majority of our implant systems in terms of bone resorption, in terms of soft tissue recession. And as we understand today, when we remove a tooth, some biological changes occur. We know that the periodontium, together with the bundle bone, are completely disintegrated. And if we don't take immediate actions at the time of bone, of tissue, of tooth extraction, then we will encounter all those detrimental effects, which we don't want to happen. So I think that there are many ways to deal with these problems, but there are certain principles that can be terms today a consensus. So if we would like to maximize our control of the tissue stability around the implants, we, the three of us, and I think that everybody here in this uh, crowd will do several things. The first step is always to thicken the gingival biotype. As we know, thick, true thick biotypes almost don't exist, maybe 10-15% of the population. So we always thicken it. We will always augment the socket after tooth removal or chamber the bone. We try to avoid, or at least to minimize, excessive surgical traumas. We are trying to use smart implant systems and we are trying to position the implant in the right way and in the right place. And of course, everybody needs to be able to master the prosthetic operations, not only in terms of occlusion, but also in terms of tissue adaptation. So all of those principles are actually summed up to what we termed some years ago the V concept. The V comes for vascularization, because whatever we do, whatever we use, we are trying to increase the vascularization in order to get vitality of the tissues. And for that, we need to be able to create as much volume of bone and soft tissue as much as we can. So in 2003, a new implant type was released to the market. 2005, it was launched by several companies. And 
this implant with the back tapered head was trying to solve some of the problems that they just mentioned so that it will let more bone around its head. We have been working with this type of implants for about 10 years. And at the same time, we learned many things about the biology of the tissues as they react towards this type of back tapered or small diameter head implants. This is why 10 years later, meaning some years ago, we came up with a slightly different concept that will allow us to start from here and to end up some months later, as you see there, with perfect tissue integration, with harmonious soft tissue, as well as stab stable bone around this type of implant systems. And the reason that we changed and we evolved from the previous back tapered implants to the new concept were several. So, after working for about 10 years with these back tapered implants, or the, the smaller head implants, uh, we've realized a few things that we'd, we would have liked to change, or at least improve if we could. One is that the, the bone gain that we get is limited to the very top of the crest. So the back tapered implants give us a little more horizontal bone as the implant emerges out of the bone, but not much more. A little below that, there's the effect diminishes and we don't get much bone there, it's just a small effect on the horizontal surface on top of the, of the crest. This is one thing we wanted to change. We wanted really more bone and more bone down the implant if we could. The other thing is, being circumferentially smaller, we sometimes compromise on the crystal stability of those implants. And the solution would, have, would, would be, and the solution that was found, is sometimes rely more on anchorage in the soft bone. So you would prepare a, a smaller, uh, smaller osteotomy and rely more on compression of the soft bone to gain, to, to, comp to compensate for the loss of crystal stability. And with that, we would get sometimes get compression of the cortical bone because a little below the top of the implant, a little below the back taper, we have the full diameter of the implant. And that would, that, that's about a millimeter, a millimeter and a half below the top of the implant. And that would compress the bone. And many times that would be in, within the, the cortical bone. And this compression is something that we sometimes pay dearly for. So we thought these things should be improved on, if possible. And yet, we all know, and the idea is, if you remove more titanium, you get more bone. The thing is, we thought, why remove titanium indiscriminately if we can remove titanium and get more bone only where it matters most? Meaning, we'll remove titanium and allow more bone to grow where we really need more bone, where the growth of more bone would make a difference. In some areas, it would not make a difference. There's enough bone, and we don't need to go there. So. Okay, and then the idea struck, why don't we shave, instead of removing some titanium from the top of the implant, why don't we shave the side of the implant, and in that way we can go as far down the implant uh, body as we want, and as deep as we can, not without je jeopardizing the connection or the, the, technical, the mechanical integrity of the, of the implant. Now we like that idea. And uh, in fact, we played with it. So, okay, we can shave one side, we can make it a little longer, a little shorter, we can shave maybe two sides on, on each <coughs> side of the implant, we can maybe shave three sides. And we really liked that idea. And we started a process of implementing it, of realizing it. And it all started with taking care of the intellectual property and then making. Uh, making prototypes and working on the prototypes, trying them in, testing all the necessary tests. Obviously, with this kind of configuration, you have to, to make sure mechanically and biologically that you're not outside of where you, where you would like to be, strength and biologic, biologic, biologically. So this took more than a year. 
realizing this concept and trying it out took more than a year and then we approached they said it's time to commercialize it and we approached and were approached by several companies major companies but at the end we decided to go to, to team with MIS for reasons that you've heard and others and um, at the beginning of when was that nine two thousand yeah, yeah some, about two years ago is uh, when the idea of the v3 was born and uh, the configuration that was chosen is the v3 implant by MIS and it's now a reality so what do we get with the v3 the most obvious is we get more bone okay because we cut three sides off of the implant we cut it to this length of about five millimeters a little bit less with the shorter implants and uh, the more the the wider the implant the more d the deeper we go close to the connection so we gain quite a lot of bone in this respect but the question we had right from the start is what happens with these gaps well as it turns out and as we all would all expect, the gaps always fill with blood. These are very small gaps. It's three separate chambers. They're very small. They always fill with uh, blood. And that's a good thing. Because we know that blood clot is the best matrix, probably, for, for starting and promoting the uh, osteogenesis. So that turned out to be a nice thing. We want more bone, and we get nicer osteogenesis starts right from the beginning. The other... Oh, this, this shows, when we say we gain bone, uh, just to have an idea of how much bone is gained by uh, the V3, let's take, for instance, a 6 millimeter uh, alveolar ridge. 6 millimeters is not uncommon. It's very common, sizes of this, uh, of this sort, like 5, 6, or 7 millimeters. So just for the demonstration's purposes, let's, uh, let's assume we use a 5 millimeter full round implant, regular rounded implant. What we get on either side is just 0 0.5 millimeters, very little bone. Okay, we could use a smaller implant, but we just want to show the difference in the bone gain. Um, when we use a, uh, the same size, a 5 millimeter V3 implant, what we have, let's assume the buckle or the bone where we want to have more, the area where we have to want to have more bone at is uh, the buckle, and it's at the top. So using a V3 implant and turning it towards that area, we have 1.2 millimeters of bone. That's more than twice. So this is significant. And um, not having enough bone in some critical areas, we pay very dearly. Um, this, the, the 1.2 millimeter implant, um, the 1.2 millimeter amount of bone, we can only get with an implant, a round implant of 3.6 millimeters. That's when they are all placed at the same, at the same level or at the same point in the, in the crest. Obviously, you can move the implant wherever you want, but that's, that's the actual gain of using a, three, a V3 implant. But you'll hear more about that and the different implants from Elad later, so you'll get more of an, uh, an idea of how much true bone gain you get with each of the implants. The second thing is we reduce the cortical compression. Now, it turns out that for some clinicians, and many, this is even more important than gaining more bone. Um, we know that mostly the, the cortical bone on the, top, on the top of the crest is very poorly vascularized and circumferential compression, which is what we rely on when we place regular implants, sometimes is very bad, very detrimental, and uh, many times we pay um, a price for that. We lose bone because of this compression on the cortical bone. It doesn't like to be compressed. So with this V3 implant, we reduce the compression on the bone. In fact, these, the, three, the three areas are uh, the, the cortical bone, which is elastic, sort of bounces in. The third, uh, we get this redu reduction of compression without losing uh, the crystal stability because the, the three points of the triangle they, hold they, they grab onto the cortical bone enough so we get enough stability on cortical bone. That's, of course, in hill sites. When we talk about extraction sockets, that's not an issue, and there's no difference between this implant and any other implant. We have to rely on holding, grabbing onto the, uh, the soft bone. Now, these, these three advantages or these three issues have to do with the top of the implant, with the V3, with the reducing the, the titanium the way we did. 
And then we, since we are coming out with a new implant, we had to decide on some other, some other things. For instance, what kind of connection we'd go with. And we picked the conical connection because of its tighter seal, the stronger, the stronger mechanical connection that it gives us. And uh, like any other connect, uh, conical connection, it gives us automatic platform shifting, so the connection is moved away from the bone, and many people like that and think it's important. You, we do get that with the conical connections. The V3s have conical connections. Um, we're left with flat surfaces, and we couldn't have left flat surfaces. Bone doesn't like flat surfaces, so we just, uh, obviously this flat surface was grooved so to uh, allow bone ad adherence and bone attachment and better distribution of forces. At the edges of the, uh, of the triangle, we still have the thread going around, so that's not a problem. Just the flat surfaces was groo were grooved, so there's no flat surface. The, the thread of the implant is a variable thread that we've known from other designs, and the, the double thread, and the, uh, the, these anchor very well into soft bone. And the, the um, step of the thread, of this thread, is 1.6 millimeters. So if you want to turn the flat surface to any direction that you would like, buckle for instance, or towards the next implant or the next tooth, you'd, could, you'd be as wrong as 0.5 millimeters from the next the next flat surface. That's not too much. These implants, being conical connection implants, they like to be a, a little submerged at the bone, bone level or maybe even below the bone level, and half a millimeter is not much, and that's what we get if you want to go to the next flat surface and point it to where you would like it to be. We also decided to make the inter interthread area rounded as opposed to squarish with angled... Uh, angled um, uh, with ang angulations, because we found that bone sometimes doesn't doesn't always find its way into these narrow angle angular um, corners, and having it rounded is something we thought would be a good idea. And uh, as we saw later in X-rays, we turned out to be true. And the flat the the, the apex of the implant, we chose a flat sir, a flat apex to make it um, um, more suitable for for uh, penetrating the bone, smaller osteotomies in cases of, of uh, uh, immediate, uh, immediate implantation right after extractions. This works very well and we get beautiful anchorage and beautiful uh, um, stability in soft bone using this apex and the type of thread we have. Now this implant has been used since the beginning of, nine, of uh, 2012. Uh, more than 2,000 implants were placed of the V3 implants. And um, by, I think, more than 150 dentists now in more than 15 countries. Yes. Um, yeah, these are the right numbers. And to give us uh, some idea of the clinical experience, Eric. So, as you can see, uh, our team in Antwerp placed the first implant or the V concept type of implant in January 2012. And uh, since then, we have placed quite a large number of these implants. In fact, the last two years, I only placed these V3 implants. And if I want to make a conclusion of the, of the, of the journey, what happened is that um, I didn't change my concept at all. So that's an advantage. You don't need to change your concept. We use it in all clinical indications. And what we saw is that for all clinical in indications and for not changing the concept of treatment that you're used to, to work with, we got better results. Not only clinical results, but also radio radiological results. So I would like to take you to three, through three cases. And I thought that in these meetings we always see nice ladies and aesthetic cases, anterior cases. I think I would show you like a full arch edentulous case because these are the cases where we place the largest number of implants, posterior, um, posterior partially edentulous case, cases or fully edentulous cases like this one. Not all of these cases, I want to show you a simple case because not all of the cases are immediate loading cases, not all of the cases are guided cases. But what I did basically is open a flap like we were used, teached to do a uh, long time ago already trying to take soft tissue into consideration and trying to apply the concept, the V concept. And I would like to show you a little video just to see how it works and what is the advantage. Maybe Nitsan, you can fast forward a little bit. So 
There's nothing, nothing has changed for me. I don't like to punch tissue. I, I like to keep the tissue. So uh, now you can stop because this is important. One of the big advantages I found is the final burr comes with the implant. So you always have a fresh burr. I decide how deep I want to go um, depending on the, on the hardness of the bone. And as you will be able to see in this magnified image, you can clearly see the advantage. It's just all around, wherever you place the triangle, you keep more bone. Wherever you place the triangle. In this case, for example, I place the triangle to the buckle because I wanted to keep the maximum of bone on the bu buckle aspect of, of the, this implant. But you can position it as you wish, and anyway, you will keep more bone. Can you fast forward a little bit, Nitsan? So we placed some uh, multi-unit abutments immediately. We torqued them down. The stability of this implant, and many people in the room have tried them, is very, very high. I could have loaded it immediately. The patient didn't want to spend the money. So basically, I placed the final abutment at the day of the surgery. We waited for eight weeks, and then I uh, loaded the implants with the final restoration. As Yuval and Nitsan already explained, there is this concave transmucosal form on the whole system. It's a comprehensive system of prosthetic components. And um, I think these pictures show you more than if I show you uh, very difficult aesthetic cases, because it's a typical case that anybody in the room will probably do. Now, what changed uh, when I was working the last few months with the MIS is that and I think this is the direction we should go. They developed like these very nice uh, scan bodies to do digital scanning, uh, intraoral scanning. And in this case, we fabricated the framework completely digitally. So we scanned the company, which was a Chinese company, made the bar and uh, sent the bar back. You can do what, uh, anything with these uh, software programs. I think for sure, and I don't think it will take more than one or two years before we can do everything digitally, like the 3D printing of the pink part and the teeth part that you will cement or bond to the, to the, to the structure, to this kind of structure. Anyway, this is the finished piece. Multi-unit screw retained uh, full arch uh, restoration, looking like this. What do I see with all of the cases that I treated? It's the quality and the thickness of the soft tissue. And we all know that if the quality and the thickness of the soft tissue is acceptable, that will, this will probably have an influence on the long-term survival of your crystal bone. Besides the soft tissue quality, we see completely different bone levels, as you can see here. This is six months post-op. It looks uh, really, really nice and happy patient. Now, we did many of these, many of uh, partially pos partially edentulous uh, sites where you place two, three implants. All of them reacted in the same way. All of them reacted. I only lost the last four years, I lost one implant, and that's not a lot. Let me show you now another case, which is an anterior case, and uh, this patient came in with three old, uh, two old three-unit bridges, and you, as you can see, it's in the aesthetic zone for sure. We can do better. And the idea in the beginning was to make two, three unit bridges. Um, I think we, uh, like we have a clear concept and the concept is we are planning from the start what will be the final result. So all the time the technicians will make a final wax up. They will even start to wax up the, the missing soft tissue. And from there on we start and go through the case. So I remove the old restorations and um, for sure, I can do better than these old ceramometal restoration. They were in for 30 years, so they did a very nice job. Making a provisional bridge, and I was ready to graft, just to make two, three unit bridges. I sent her to the endodontist to try to make a new root canal treatment on the central, and to do eventually non-vital bleaching, and he told me, Eric, doesn't work. There's some cracks, there's a problem with the root, so I need to go to a uh, implant placement. So my treatment plan changed a little bit during the surgery. And I think I want to show the case because we have a, n a very nice 4K video of the implant going in, the extraction first, then the drilling sequence. And I think you, there is a certain drilling sequence on the flyer of the company, but for sure, like with every implant system, you will adapt the drilling sequence to what you want to obtain. 
So the first drill, you can use the second drill, but the most important thing is that this implant comes with the final drill and the final drill will allow you to position the implant very nicely and in a very stable way, as you can see. So it's triangular. You can see there's a little spot on the implant, but that's just a sterile saline that contaminated the surface, just turning it in, and it's up to you to decide. Now, if I want to augment the site and I have the flat surface towards the buckle, I think I will keep more bone, and you will see in some cases later on that we, uh, on the comb beam CTs, that there is a more volume than if you would use a, a cylindrical implant. We don't change the concept. Why would we change the concept? I don't need to change my concept. And the concept is the same, and Nitsan explained you that there's five rules, and one of the rules is stick in the tissue. In these cases, I would like to use this connective tissue graft. We do like a very simple uh, pouch procedure and insertion of the connective tissue graft. We place a filler material. Wait for healing. Impression is very easy. You, I don't know if you will have the opportunity to try the components like the prosthetic components and impression copings on the implant. It's a very tactile connection. And the profile is the same for impression copings than for your final abutment, your tie base or your multi-unit or whatever. It's very tactile. You should try. We didn't change the concept from a lab technician's point of view, neither. We are doing always the same, trying to uh, develop the soft tissue contour, and it's the same for my pontic as for my implant restoration, as for eventually a natural tooth. Um, Nitsan, Professor Bichacho, all, all of you know, published already a long time ago about the cervical contouring concept. It's basically what we are doing using a tie base, a prefabricated zirconia component, and I really like the fit of these components, and I really, really like also that I have a titanium connection to my conical internal parts. I think that's really mandatory today to have this kind of titanium part, which is yellow colored. What is a problem sometimes if you have these two millimeter concave abutments is the color of the titanium. If it's grayish, it will shine through sometimes. So the nice thing is it's yellowish, and if it's gold colored, it looks uh, quite acceptable. So we're reshaping a little bit the form. We are placing it intraorally, reshaping <coughs> the tissue, checking the, the pressure on the tissue, and I think it's not different than what we are used to do since 15, 20, 30 years. It's something completely this, uh, similar. So she came from here, and we go here. And what is important is to look at the bone levels. The bone levels for me look different than I was used to see with the systems that I've been using for the last 30 years. So why is it? Probably, probably for a few reasons, and you've already explained you, it's like no cortical compression. I think that's the killer in many posterior uh, implants placements is the killing the cortical bone, leaving more space for uh, for a new bone to, uh, to grow. And one of the nice cases we did the last uh, few months is this case. And I want to show it because it's a quite aggressive, not aggressive, it's a biologic treatment, but it's an augmentation case that is not easy to do. Um, if you look at the X-ray, she had a parachute accident. She, these two teeth, uh, the two centrals were out, they were splinted. It's not easy because of many reasons, soft tissue levels, uh, canine in lateral position, so we will have to plan very well. I'm not going to go through the planning, but I want to show you because this is typically something we do is look from a different angle to try to uh, evaluate the, the case. We look at the face and we look at the comb beam and you will see on the comb beam that on one side this is the left central, there's still a little bit of bone the marginal bone is still there, but the huge defect there. But when we navigate to the right-hand side, this is what we see on the right-hand side. Now, I've been a lot in Brazil the last few years, the last 10 years, and I met a guy called Carso and another guy called Jose Carlos Rosa. And they developed a very biological, unique technique that allows you to graft without any membrane, without any artificial material. Now, I want to focus on the combination between the implant design and the grafting that I will be doing uh, afterwards. So the, s the same thing, initial design, trying to understand what will be your final result or 
approximately, like 90% should be fixed on the initial wax up. Before extracting, sometimes we just prep and do a mock-up to visualize the results, not only for you and for your dental technician, but also for your patient, because then she can see where we will go. So before extracting, sometimes it's two minutes prepping and placing a mock-up. Implant placement, guided. Since a few months, I'm using the M-Guide system, which is a very nice system. It's just you have the DICOM files, you s they scan the model, you superimpose, and you get a, a, um, a very nice surgical guide. Placing the implants, as we all know, on the palatal, and I want the flat surface to the buckle. I think the augmentation thickness or the material in the buckle will be much better if I have a flat surface than if I have, if I have a round surface. <coughs> At the same time, if you have two adjacent implants and they are triangular, we know that most of the vascularity comes from the palatal aspect. So if you, are, if you keep more bone on the palatal aspect, probably the vascularity from this side will be much better. So placing the implant on the palatal side, leaving the space, and as you can see, the buckle bone, as you saw already on the comb beam, buckle bone completely gone. Now, this technique is a little bit different. They take from the maxillary tuberosity, cortical, medullus, and sometimes even three, three layers, also soft tissue, connective tissue, no membrane, no incision. I think not only the aspect or the form of the implant should be more biological than looking like a natural tooth, but everything should become more biological means we are, we are trying to avoid incisions to keep the vascularization. We are trying to use uh, autogenous material, not, no membranes, no grafts. This is how it looks after three months, four months. Now, you can say, okay, I don't see the bone, but I will show you immediately the, the comb beam. Well, what is important for me? When I saw this picture, I thought I'm going to try to get a section of a central superimpose it and we will all understand that nature designed these teeth not only because it should be like this but probably also to leave more space from the palatal for vessels to come nature didn't make a round surface on the buckle and if we compare it with the implant it looks like quite logical that this form is mimicking nature and is being very biological <coughs> So, not only just a picture and superimposing an image, it's also a comb beam. Pre-op, post-op, I can see the triangular form. Imagine now a cylindrical implant, you get very thin bone on the buccal aspect. And if you get very thin bone on the buccal aspect, and we all know, all of us who are placing implants, if it's critical, this is where you're going to get a resorption. If you get a resorption, the soft tissue is going to recede, the surface is going to be contaminated, and we, get, we run into problems. So if we, I asked the engineers at the University in Leuven to superimpose the two images uh, exactly, and this is what we found. So on the one side, the one without bone, the bone is there. So the graft took very nicely. We get thickness. Thickness because of the nice graft, but also because of the implant design. Taking impressions, going to the final contour, very easy. You should read uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Bichacho's article. We make a blue line on the, on the wax, we press it against the... Uh, with the blue line is the final soft tissue contour and the final tooth form, the gingival tooth form. Press it against the model, we are taking these tie bases, the tie base looks very nice now. They have like one millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeter concave transgingival form and just connect and bond uh, zirconia abutment on top. So we are reshaping the tissue using these components. You can have these components bonded, prefabricated bonded or separate. And then you just bond them after changing the form. For example, in this case, we use zirpress to adapt to the final contour like you can see here. Having the final restorations intraorally, we made two veneers on the laterals trying to change light reflection, trying to, again, trying to be biologic or having a biological prep, trying to change line angle position. It's not perfect, but it's very acceptable. And the nice thing is when I saw the comb beams confirming what I've been seeing the last four years, and what I see the last four years is something clinical. And I know there's a lot of research going on now, and we should evaluate it, but what I see is if I probe, the bone is up to the implant level. 
My soft tissue looks nicer, probably because of the thickness of the bone. The soft tissue, it has an effect for me clinically on the soft tissue thickness. And if we go to this one, this one is exactly telling me what I should, what I should see. D imagine a cylindrical implant on the buccal aspect. This is where you're going to have run into problems, probably. And if I cut the skull, I can, you can do it in your software. You can see the implants in the bone. Now, the triangular form is a huge advantage, not only in this case, but also in the case of the old professor man with the lower full arch, because I keep bone everywhere around in a completely different way. Next case. So this was a very interesting case where Eric uh, utilized a different type of augmentation methodology that has been advocated in Brazil for some years by certain people. I would like to share with you the last case. The last case is an interesting case because uh, it is not a case of a model of a very gorgeous woman. It's a case of a gorgeous person, of a very nice girl that due to medical conditions in her past, she was partially paralyzed in one part of her face. And about eight months ago, she went through a car accident. And she uh, lost two of her teeth, the lateral incisor and the canine. Now, together with the teeth, as you can see here, she fractured the maxilla and she lost also the alveolar processes of both teeth. So when we have cases like that, or I would say in any dental treatment, we always need to start with the treatment planning because once we have the plan, then we know where we are heading to. Uh, in this type of cases, what we do is actually trying to harmonize between different interfaces. This is what we do in the dentistry. If you are successful in harmonizing between different interfaces, then you will succeed. If one interface is not harmonized, then problems start. So we would like to start with augmenting the bone that is missing. And once we are into uh, right volume of the bone housing, then we can develop the soft tissue around it, then we can place the implants in order to have anchorage for individual crown, as we promised to this young girl that uh, suffered too much after this accident. And of course, we will need to take care of the interface between the tissues and the restorations and the tissues and the implants and the implants and the abutments Everything needs to be controlled, but the most challenging thing in such cases is that we have to restore everything unilaterally. So we need to be able to compare or to harmonize the restorative part with the natural uh, part. So uh, we always start uh, with this type of uh, backwards planning with a diagnostic wax up that will lead us the way because once we know what are the shape of the new taste, where should they be located, then we can create our uh, adjunct uh, treatments. So we waited about one month. After one month, the tissue started to heal, and we were able to provide her with this type of provisional fixed partial denture with two pontics. And then, once we had it, we went into bone reconstruction and in this case, we utilized a mixture of particulate bone, allograft with xenograft, with some uh, tetracycline, and then some bioactive factors from her own blood. And then uh, a collagen membrane, uh, which is highly cross-linked, made in Israel, by the way. And with that, we utilized the PRF mainly because we see in our uh, practice that for the initial closure of the wound, we get much better results. So uh, we are not afraid of uh, uh, different type of exposures of the membranes. Uh, this is uh, the main reason to use this uh, uh, PRF. We aim for an immediate uh, primary closure of the wound. And as you can see here, after five months, we were able to obtain a pretty nice volume. Uh, for us to uh, forward up the treatment. You can compare 
how it was before, how uh, we look at the volume now. So uh, when we realize that we have sufficient volume, then uh, we could plan ahead the implant placement. And we do it as uh, Eric uh, showed us before. Uh, this is a case where it is actually a late placement of two adjacent implants unilaterally and we will try to do it flapless because I don't need to raise a flap if I know exactly where the implant should be in order to retain screw retained crowns so I know that the implant need to be in the circumferences of the envelope of bone I want the implant to have minimum of two millimeters labial bone I want each implant to retain screw retained restorations and they can plan it ahead because we can superimpose the actual wax up whether it is virtual wax up or physical wax up together with the implant STLs and here you can see very nice the cross cut of both implants so actually we are going to utilize the M guide which is a very fresh guide that allows the operator to look through. It allows, if you would like to, use some water spray during your drillings. It is very fixed. Those of you who know the M guide or use the smoke know that the filling is very, very secure when you drill through this guide. And actually what we did here is to place one implant at the lateral incisor which is a narrow platform implant and one implant at the canine which is a regular or standard uh, diameter implant and we are doing it flapless as you can see here very easy the chambers between the implant and the bone will fill up with blood the blood will coagulate and osteogenesis will start in the chambers around this, the head, the triangular head, between the flat surface and the bone, we will have both contact osteogenesis from the side of the implant and distant osteogenesis from the side of the bone. And these both procedures will accelerate bone formation uh, around the implant head. In addition, we pouch the area and we inserted some additional connective tissue graft because as you remember according to the V concept we try to create as much volume as we can in any procedure this is how it looks like three months later what do you see here that we used very narrow healing abutments why is that to let the tissue heal in a bigger volume around these abutments so we have also some modified abutments that would allow in such a case more tissue to heal and to mature around these narrow abutments. Look at the profile of the bone. I think that we are in the right stage now to start our prosthetic phase. Now we took here a regular elastomeric material impression with open tray. You can do it with closed tray. You can use the scan bodies and scan it if you have a scanner. This is now an interesting phase because from this type of traditional treatment we dive now into a virtual world because we scanned the models and from now on everything until delivering of the fixed prosthetics is being done virtually and this is very interesting. It's very interesting to be able to integrate this system like some other system but this system in particular with the digital virtual workflow that is able today. So we go through 3D computer assisted design through a specific software and we place the crowns or the shape, the virtual three dimensional shape and surface of the crowns wherever we want it to be in terms of aesthetics and in terms of occlusion. And this is done on the computer. Once we have it, we have now STL files that can be transferred by email to any lab that you want 
And this lab will utilize what you see here. So actually we have here uh, one crown on the central incisor, one implant crown and abutment for the lateral as well as for the canine. Then we have one crown for the first premolar and one veneer because we wanted to labialize the tooth there for the second premolar. Everything is already set in terms of form, in terms of precision. And moreover, we can utilize our softwares today to create model-based cervical contouring, what Eric mentioned before, the cervical contouring concept. It is being done digitally. And then the abutments are being designed according to the modification of the tissue on the virtual model. Then we emerge and come back now to reality. Now we can print the three-dimensional model from the STL files and create a regular silicon index and we will utilize this index to prepare the actual model that we had before, before we scanned it. The machine, any robot, will mill out from a block of ceramic, whether it is zirconia or lithium desilicate, the exact shape of any of the components that we saw before. So actually, what we get from the technician is this type of restorations. They can be monolithic and stained superficially, or in this case, the three anterior crowns were cut back on the labial and veneered with porcelain for better aesthetic effect. So we have here number 21, layered zirconia, number 22, abutment, zirconia on titanium, and layered zirconia crown, the same for 23. Number 24 was monolithic zirconia, and number 25 was monolithic Emax veneer. What is interesting is that we tried in the abutments. You can see how beautiful not only the fit of the abutment to the implants is, but also the nice bone and soft tissue that we were able to obtain during all these procedures. And you can see also the nice cross cut of uh, the canine. You see it less uh, precise on the narrow diameter, but believe me, it's there, that we were able to obtain. When I removed those abutments, we see how they actually create the shape of the tissue around it. So the tissue adapts to the shape of your crowns or abutments right away, but as you know, it will take some month, maybe a year or two, until it completely mature. So there is a difference between what we say adaptation and maturation. Here we are talking only now about adaptation because it will take time. It will take time. Meanwhile, we connected the crowns over the implant abutments and then we bond it and then we finish it and polish it and just go to the last tooth, number 25, to bond the veneer. And it's very interesting to see the transformation of the tissue around the implants because it was designed virtually. And then when you look at the adaptation of the tissue to the circumferential profile, the submergence profile and the emergence profile of those uh, single restoration, you see how nicely the scalloping starts and the papilla starts to fill, and this is just two days after connection. So we know how it will look like, probably much better when it will mature in some months. This is how it looks like. Uh, it might not be the nicest smile, as I told you before. This patient had some medical conditions before, but we think that this type of treatments and this system can serve better every one of our patients. You can see that the fit of all components, especially of the implant components, is perfect. And this is what we would like to see. We would like to see the bone covering the head or at the level of the head of the implants. We would like to see the very narrow tulip shape crowns coming out, emerging from this conical connection and as Eric said before, we see over and over again the bone covering this junction between the implant and the abutment. This is the smile of uh, our patients some days after connecting 
the restorations. I can tell you that uh, besides the V3, uh, based on the same concept, there are several things in the pipeline of MIS that I think are very exciting, like, for instance, this V3 STL, or the soft tissue level implant, that anybody here can just run his imagination where do we want it to get. And you should know that the top of the implant is inside, within the connective tissue over the implant head. So this is not a completely tissue level implant like you know, but it's a little bit, 1.5, 2 millimeters, we have to decide yet, above the bone. You still have enough space to develop the emergence profile and at the same time have the connection away from the bone level. So there are many, many interesting uh, developments in the pipeline based on the V concept. And I'm very happy that you were able to be here with us and to learn a little bit about our thoughts. And I'm very happy that MIS uh, accepted to work with us. Thank you very much.